oxidation reduction reactions. In this type of reaction, we have electrons being transferred from one reactant to another reactant. These are also called redox reaction because oxidation reduction is just a mouthful. So redox, which always makes me think of red box and makes me want to watch a movie, but it's redox. So many redox reactions involve something reacting with oxygen. Um, this reaction with oxygen is where the term oxidation came from. Um, oxidation is getting oxygen. So here we see iron reacting with oxygen to form an um, a compound, right? So we have Fe2O3. We can have this octane that we've looked at this reaction before. This burns, combines with oxygen, forms carbon dioxide and water. The carbon has gained oxygen. In this first one, the iron has gained oxygen. It's become oxidized. Here we have hydrogen, pointers acting up, hydrogen and oxygen reacting. The hydrogen gets oxidized to form water. So here's um, an illustration of this reaction. So here we have a balloon full of hydrogen and oxygen gas, a very explosive combination. And uh, you touch that with a flame and you get that. Kaboom. A balloon that size would probably, the, the explosion would probably be enough that it would make the ceiling tiles bump up and down. Like, kaboom, be really loud. We're not gonna do that and we're not gonna do that at home. That's why they won't let you buy oxygen and hydrogen. Um, so here we have these, and they're, they're combining to form water. When that happens, it releases a tremendous amount of energy. Here we have an oxidation reduction reaction without oxygen. So often oxygen is involved, but it doesn't have to be. So this is um, salt forming from the elements. So you've got sodium ions and chloride molecules. Chlorine is one of those diatomic elements. And so when you have the element by itself, um, those, those atoms don't like to go alone. And so they'll take a friend, a buddy system. In this reaction, the sodium gives an electron to one of the chlorines. When that happens, the sodium becomes a cation and the chlorine becomes an anion. And now they're really attracted to each other because of the opposite charges and so they combine to form sodium chloride. An electron has been transferred, and that's what's happening in redox reactions. So you take this poisonous gas and this metal that reacts violently with water, neither of which you should put in your mouth, and you get sodium chloride, which we put in our mouths all the time, table salt. Reactions of metals with nonmetals, and we're talking the elements here, a nonmetal element reacting with a metal element, these are typically going to be redox reactions. So if we have sodium reacting with oxygen, sodium reacting with chlorine, there's um, an electron transfer taking place. If we look at what's happening with the charges, here we've got sodium. Um, the sodium is losing an electron, becoming the sodium ion. The oxygens are gaining electrons. Each one is gaining two electrons to become a minus two. And if you look at that, you can see why we don't typically write the charges in a, in a formula for a compound. It gets really messy. And here's the sodium and the chlorine, and that forms sodium chloride. So we've taken free elements and converted them into ions by transferring electrons. In doing that transformation, one atom has to gain an electron, one atom has to lose an electron, and there has to be this handoff. So if one atom loses an electron, there has to be another one to take the electron. There's not a homeless shelter for electrons where you can go and adopt one if you need one or, or discard one if you don't. The electrons are always passed off to another atom or ion. So oxidation and reduction are always happening together. So in this sodium and chlorine reaction, um, the sodium is losing an electron and the chlorines are gaining electrons. 
So losing an electron is called oxidation. Gaining an electron is called a reduction. Just had a brain fart there. Um, so there's another of men, another example of many situations where we have these two pairs of things that we have to correlate. We've got cation and anion, positive and negative. How do we keep them straight? So um, oxidation reduction, you can use this oil rig. Oil, oxidation is loss. Rig reduction is gain, and we're talking about electrons. So we can have oxidation reduction where electrons are completely transferred and ions are formed. But we can also have an incomplete transfer and that still qualifies as oxidation reduction. So here we have an example with hydrogen and chlorine. As an element, hydrogen is a diatomic molecule and those two hydrogen atoms are sharing the electrons equally. Chlorine is also a diatomic element um, a Cl2 molecule, the chlorines are sharing the electrons equally. When these react and form hydrogen chloride, they are still sharing the electrons, but it's not shared equally anymore. Chlorine is bigger and pulls the electrons away from hydrogen. So hydrogen has not become an ion, but it has lost some of its electron density. And chlorine hasn't become an ion here, but it's gained. So if you think about maybe blanket sharing in a bed, right? Here they were sharing equally, sharing equally, and you swap partners, and now it's not equal anymore. So hydrogen's lost out, not getting as much blanket as before. That's an incomplete transfer. So the chlorine has experienced an increase in electron density. A gain of electrons is reduction. So the chlorine's re been reduced. Um, the hydrogen has been oxidized. It's experienced a decrease in electron density, a loss of electrons. It didn't lose the whole electron, but it lost some of it. So it can be confusing to figure out which one is gaining and which one is losing electrons when you're talking about nonmetals reacting with each other. When you have a metal and a nonmetal, ions are being formed and it's, it's much clearer, easier to see. So we use something we called oxidation states or oxidation numbers to keep track of the electrons before and after a chemical reaction to see who gained electron density, who lost electron density. So it's very important to understand that oxidation states are not ion charges. They are imaginary charges that we assign based on a set of rules. Ion charges are real and measurable. What makes this distinction a little difficult is that an oxidation state is generally the same number as an ion charge, but they're not the same thing. So these are the rules for assigning oxidation states. And we do these rules in order of priority. And like many things, when you actually write stuff down and spell it all out, it ends up looking a lot more complicated than how you think of it when you actually do it. So we'll go through the rules and then I'll try to show you that it's really not that bad. So free elements have an oxidation state of zero. So sodium, the element, its oxidation state is zero. Chlorine, the element, its oxidation state is zero. What we'll find is that the oxidation states often match up with actual charges. Here, there's no actual charge, so the state is zero, the charge is zero. If we're looking at monatomic ions, such as sodium ion in sodium chloride, chloride ion, the oxidation state is the equal to the charge. So a sodium ion has a plus one oxidation state. A chloride ion has a minus one oxidation state. The sum of the oxidation states of atoms in a compound is zero, just like the sum of charges in a compound is zero. The sum of the oxidation states has to be zero. 
If you have a neutral molecule, I don't know why they separate that out as a compound. Um, it's going to add up to zero. If you have a polyatomic ion, such as nitrate ion, overall this has a negative one charge. So the oxidation numbers for the atoms in that thing have to add up to negative one. In their compounds, metals always have positive oxidation states. For the metals, their oxidation state is almost always just their charge. Group one metals are plus one, group two metals are plus two. The nonmetals. Okay, so this is the part where things are different than just thinking about charges because fluorine, chlorine, bromine, if they're in, in compounds, with nonmetals, they're not going to have charges. So then what do we do? Well, it's still a lot like the charge of an ion. So this is how I think of it. In a compound, these nonmetals would like to have an oxidation state that is the same as the charge they would have if they were an ion. So fluorine, if it was an ion, would have, an would have a charge of negative one. Right? So it would like to have an oxidation state of negative one. A hydrogen ion has what charge? Plus one. So hydrogen would like to have that for its oxidation number, oxidation state. An oxygen ion has a charge of minus two. This is what oxygen would like for its oxidation state. Now, can everybody have what they want? No. No, they can't. And so we have a list. This is the list that says who gets what they want, who gets first choice. So this is the list. Fluorine gets first choice. Fluorine, then hydrogen, oxygen, and then if there's a group 7A element, next, and then a group 6A element, and then a group 5A element. And the, the oxidation state they have is the, the same as the charge they would have if they were an ion. So really what we need to do is we need to remember that list. You guys know what pho is? Delicious Vietnamese noodles, right? Yum, right? Pho. Well, what if I take an eraser and just erase a little smidge of that P? You could still pronounce that pho, right? 765. There's actually a restaurant that's pho 76. But this is pho 765. Fluorine, hydrogen, oxygen, group 7, group 6, group 5. How's that? So I just say to myself, pho 765. If there's fluorine, he gets to be, well, she, she gets to be negative 1. If there's hydrogen, he gets to be plus one, okay? Oh, I forgot. Um, you can have fractional oxidation states, and <clears throat> I won't try to trick you with this, but just so you know I'm not being inconsistent. We write the sign before the number for oxidation states, and we write the sign after the number for ionic charges. Okay, let's do oxidation states for these. So CR, what's the oxidation state? Well, this is an element, right? Is there a charge on it? It's just CR, there's no charge. So this is gonna have an oxidation state of zero. Any element just by itself will have an oxidation state of zero. Here I have a chromium ion. What's its oxidation state? It's the charge. So here the oxidation state is the same number as the charge. CCl4. Okay, so I don't have any ions, so I can't specify any of those. I've got two nonmetals. And so then I say pho 765. 
there's no fluorine, there's no hydrogen, there's no oxygen. Group seven, do I have a group seven element? Yes, I do, it's chlorine. So the chlorine, what would chlorine like to have? Chlorine would like to have negative one because if it was an ion, that's what its charge would be. So chlorine would like to be negative one. Now carbon has to be whatever is needed. So just like charges in an ionic compound, oxidation states have to add up to the overall charge on the compound. This is a molecule with an overall charge of zero. So what I've got is I've got four chlorines and they are each minus one. So those are my four chlorines. And I've got one carbon. So if I've got minus one, minus one, minus one, minus one, and I need to have all of this add up to zero, what's the oxidation state for carbon? Plus four. So FA765 tells me who gets what they want, and you keep going down until you get to the last one, and that one just has to pick up the slack, suck it up, and be whatever it needs to be. So the chlorine's negative one there, and the carbon is plus four. Each chlorine is negative one, and that one carbon is plus four. Any questions about that one? So SRBr2, is this a molecular compound or an ionic compound? Strontium is a metal, right? <coughs> Bless you. So this is an ionic compound. So to find the oxidation states, we can just look at the ion charges. So strontium makes a two plus ion, and there are actually bromide ions in this, right, Br minus. These are monatomic ions. Their oxidation state is the same as their charge. So, this is in the way. So for strontium, its oxidation state is plus two, because that's what the charge is in the compound. And for bromine, the oxidation state is minus one, each of them. Any questions? SO3, is that ionic? It looks a lot like a sulfite ion, but there's no charge. This is sulfur trioxide. I've got two nonmetals, Fa765. Fluorine? Nope. Hydrogen? Nope. Oxygen? Yes, I have oxygen. Oxygen gets to choose. What does oxygen choose? Negative two. There are three oxygens. They'll always choose the same thing. They're each minus two. So what does the sulfur have to be? Plus six. Any questions? This is a neutral compound, a neutral molecule. The oxidation numbers of all the atoms in it have to add up to zero because this is neutral. This is an ion, nitrate ion. This has a negative one charge, so all the oxidation states have to add up to minus one. So I've got nitrogen and oxygen. Who gets their pick? Oxygen, Fa seven, six, five. F, H, O. Oxygen wants to be negative two. So then you maybe need to think a little harder about this one. We've got three oxygens and they are each negative two. And I have this nitrogen. I don't know what its oxidation state is. And all of this has to add up to minus one. Together the oxygens are minus six. What's the nitrogen? Plus five. questions? That's a good question. How do I know what the oxygen is choosing? We have the first 765 to tell me that oxygen gets to choose. All of those guys will choose the oxidation state that's equal to the charge they would have if they were an ion. 
Okay, so we know that oxygen as an ion would be negative two. So that's the oxidation state it chooses. So fluorine, what would that one be? Negative one. Okay. How about phosphorus? In a compound, negative three. Okay. Any other questions?